House of Fata Morgana is a visual novel. Now, before you click off the video, you close-minded piece of garbage, let me sell you on the series for a moment, all right? Just let me do that. Now, for those of you that don't know what a visual novel is, it's sort of like a video game, sort of. Okay, you know, like in RPG games, in the cutscenes where you would have like the PNGs of the character, and then they're having their little moments of dialogue. That's what a visual novel is, but without the gameplay whatsoever. And if y'all thought sane and manga fans were elitists, oh, y'all ain't seen nothing yet. The House of Autumn Morgana was made in 2012 by Novik Tackle, but it was only Japan exclusive. It wouldn't get a North American release until like 2019 for the PS Vita and the PlayStation 4, and it would get a release for the Nintendo Switch in 2021. It is written by the brilliant Keika Hanada, and the art is done by Moyotaro. But with all that information in context, what is the story about? And for here, we actually have to go to the setting. You wake up this spirit, you don't know who you are, you don't know where you are, although the place seems familiar, and you've run into a maid. Now the mansion you reside in is a mansion where many people have lived before in previous eras, and the maid has been there in every single era. The point of the story, at least from what you know up till now, is you're trying to remember who you are and which era pertained to you. And there's also a rumor about the mansion in which you reside in currently that it was haunted by a witch and the witch curses everybody who's ever lived there and they all will befall tragedy. And so the maid will take you through door by door to each era so you can watch and see as these stories unfold so you can see if you can remember who you were. So why is this the best story I've read in the last two years? Well, in order to answer that, we're going to have to go through door one. Door one takes us to 1603 with two siblings. These are going to be the two primary characters of our story until somebody else comes in. The two siblings, brother and sister, the brother being Mel and the sister being Nelly, are also known as flaxen haired children, which is basically a yellowish brown tint of hair, if you will. Now, the House of Fata Morgana throughout its different doors takes inspirations from many different European cultures, the strongest ones seeming to be Italian, French, and English. And there's even a classical song done in the late 1900s called The Flaxen-Haired Girl done by a French composer. I just want to point out the very strong contrast you get when you initially start the story versus going through door one. Uh, initially, it's dark, it's mysterious, it's run down, it's heavy. And immediately, you see these two happy children with this upbeat music in the background. And speaking of the music, the music in this series is great. There are a lot of soundtracks and there are a lot of great ones. Admittedly though, the soundtrack in Door 1 can get uh, a little bit annoying and some of the soundtracks are more so just for ambience purposes. Uh, they're not really stuff that you could listen to, in my opinion, on their own. But there's plenty of other great sound pieces throughout this entire series. The music does a great job of just evoking the feeling in the scenes though and sticking in your head. But uh, you start off with these two innocent children, Mel and Nelly, and the reason uh, I called this door one incest is because as they grow up, it turns out that Nelly is legitimately in love with her older brother, Mel. And Mel is a, a normal human being, uh, although for context, again, this is 1603, although I'm not sure exactly how common sibling relationships was, but besides the point. But the story in door one is very slice of life. The only drama you get really near the beginning is when Nelly is getting married off off to another noble and she doesn't saying that Mel is her prince and I think Mel doesn't fully understand what she really means by that as he simply sees her as completely childish seeming a bit oblivious to her romantic intentions everything changes when one day it is said that the house got a new servant and when Mel walks down the hallway one night he gets the urge to peek through the door and sees this beautiful girl with white hair and red eyes. I think you can all see where this is gonna go wrong. The white-haired girl is a very important character, so just keep her in mind. Mel, on the other hand, is sort of your primary character in this door, if you will, the protagonist of door one. And he's, he's pretty normal in my opinion. There's nothing too different about him, but yet one is incredibly invested in this relationship, seeing that him and the white-haired girl will eventually fall in love, and that's where the story goes. Now, because of the pacing of Fata Morgana, which is something that I'll kind of get into in the next door, uh, it, it can get you very, very impatient. But yet there's a lot of great scenes, and again, the dialogue really shines in this series with the way that the characters interact. Uh, there's an important scene in the library where these two characters come closer, and the white-haired girl tells him of a story 
of a girl who's trapped in a dark place. Uh, she went out and sent letters, somebody was sending letters back, and then eventually the guy came to rescue her. It's just watching this wholesome relationship take place. Till one night, the white-haired girl goes into Mel's room and tries to choke him out to death. I'm not kidding at all. This is exactly what's going down. And Mel is completely relaxed. I think this is when you get a bit more of his personality, him being a bit more rational, although it's clear that he's young and he's still very emotion-fueled. And a total helpless romantic. Uh, the white-haired girl can't bring herself to kill Mel, though, as he's been nothing but the kindest person to her. However, that's when her motivations are revealed, that her father was once a painter for the family and that he was kicked out. And so her and her father lived in absolute poverty and misery. So now she seeks revenge on the family that brought this life upon her and her father. And if my memory serves me correct, there's a scene that happened, actually a couple scenes before this, where the white-haired girl is helping Nellie clean her room and Nellie decides to brag about a painting she has of her and Mel and the white-haired girl just simply compliments and move on. But I instantly picked up on that connection when I first read it, I just had no idea where it was going. But going back to the scene where the white-haired girl is choking Mel out, uh, th that's actually a turning point for them as well, as then they each confess their feelings for each other, Mel first confessing his love for her. But man, did this series love taking its sweet time to get to that. The tension escalates when Nellie is given off to another noble, and Mel essentially denies her feelings, saying that no, she needs to move on and do this because it will be good for the family and all that. And she says she doesn't want to be used as some sort of bargaining piece that she's in love with Mel. But Mel is completely oblivious to this, again, completely enamored with the white-haired girl. Throughout all of this, there's a scene where the maid interacts with the white-haired girl as the white-haired girl touches a rose and it turns red. So it seems that the maid knows who the white-haired girl is or knows of her past, who she truly is and what her purpose is for being here. As to what that is, well, that remains a mystery. But things fully escalate when Nellie goes to a theater play with her now, well, arranged partner, if you will, and while she's there, she sees her brother Mel with a white-haired girl who's in a beautiful dress. She confronts her brother, and Mel finally snaps at her, yelling at her, telling her to grow up, and that he has no interest in her whatsoever. That's not what he said word for word, but I mean, he, he might as well have said it. Nellie runs off into her room and begins to destroy the things, and as she does that, she throws the painting of her and Mel, and when she does, on the back, she sees the date of the painting. However, the painting was made before Nellie was even born. So the painting begins to peel a little bit, if you will, as if it was painted over, showing that the girl that was painted with Mel wasn't Nelly, but in fact the white-haired girl. Nelly goes insane, enters the room where the white-haired girl is staying, and then while Mel is in bed, he's then straddled by a girl with beautiful white hair, but then opens his eyes to see it's his sister Nelly with the hair of the white-haired girl as a wig, revealing to Mel that the white-haired girl is his half-sister which is the reason why the mother took her in and the reason why the painter was kicked out of their house. So Nelly, who didn't want to be with his sister because they were siblings, was actually in love with his half-sister. Double incest. Damn! Mel, of course, is completely destroyed and heartbroken, but he goes wandering and searching for the white-haired girl, eventually finding her when she's hiding behind a corner, saying that she's hideous and that it wouldn't work out and that she apologizes, and Mel's like, he doesn't care about any of that, he just loves her and wants to be with her, and then when he walks over to turn the corner, she's gone. Never to see her ever again. Door 1 would be my definition of 0 to 100. It really does ramp up in the ending with that twist, and yet everything was being put there in front of you without you even noticing it. So the dialogue does not just serve the purpose of presenting the characters, it does a great job of hinting at all of the different mysteries that are happening, not just in each respective door, but in the grander narrative of Fata Morgana in the first place. And overall, I think door one has the strongest plot twist of the first three doors. Well, door two is pretty. I'm not sure if that's either because it's your first experience with the series and how it does things, or if simply the other parts afterwards just had reveals and twists that one could kind of see coming. In terms of the characters in this part, it's clear that the white-haired girl has much more to be expanded upon, and I think Mel is solid, he's enjoyable, he's a character that you could get invested in, but I think the one who ends up stealing the entire show with that ending is Nelly. And now we are left with the mysteries of who is the white-haired girl, who are we, and who is the maid still. So now that era closes and we are taken to the next era, door two. 
We are taken to 1707. The mansion has been completely destroyed and desolate, and I've also just realized that I've been calling it the House of Fata Morgana instead of the House in Fata Morgana, my apologies. But the only inhabitant left in the mansion, or well, manor, is the maid. But yet, going down to the cellar, she sees a beast. And from here on out, we have a complete tonal shift of this door in comparison to door one. Door one starting with this bright and cheery music eh, with two children. And this one starting with a savage bloodthirsty beast who we can't understand in a heavy environment. Uh, we then get a tell of this beast killing off villagers and anybody who'd visit one by one. And all of these brutal disgusting depictions. So door two instantly becomes something of a psychological horror. Stuff of nightmares really that if it were to be depicted fully in visual, I think it'd be a bit stomach churning. Which is, I mean, kind of dope. And the maid has no other choice but to help because he is now the master of the manor. I think by doing this, it shows very clearly that the maid is tied to the mansion a little more than we would think. As well as her morals are clearly put onto display because if she's willing to help these beasts with these atrocious actions, what else isn't she willing to do? What is she doing behind the scenes? The maid helps the beast, or bestia, to read, speak, sort of act a little bit more like a civilized human being. Again, this is a bit of a psychological horror, so everything that happens cannot be taken as literal. Something that was a little more evident to me upon retrospect. Uh, he even kills a merchant who visits, inviting him into his home, and then tearing him apart. And he continues on these horrible, horrible, horrible deeds until one day, a white-haired girl arrives. Considering how the last door had ended in tragedy, and we were given the warning that anybody who lived in the manor would befall tragedy. I already knew 100%. I was just wondering how it would emotionally get me invested this time. Bestia continues to develop feelings for the white-haired girl and he continues to become more and more civilized as then we're taken to another character and her name is Pauline. And she's pretty much engaged to this man called Yukimasa who will be embarking on a trip on, on a ship if you will. And these two you see their interactions you see Pauline who is this very innocent and likable character and again I don't know if y'all made the connection yet but as soon as I saw these two interact I was like oh no 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 quick shout out to my boy Roma who got me into the series but if we actually placed bets on all the times I called something he would owe me a couple hundred dollars her lover Yukimasa goes missing and then she goes in search for him in a village and in that village she encounters a little boy whose family was killed by Bestia and from here on out the interactions with Bestia and the white haired girl and Pauline and Javi switch back and forth. I am going to be completely honest, this was brutal to sit through. And again, this is one of those things where you just have to keep in mind that this series loves to take its time with things, and there are scenes that matter more than you might think they do at the moment, and then in retrospect they make a whole lot more sense. And this is one of those moments where at the time going through it, I was a bit miserable, but in the end, I felt the payoff was nonetheless worth it. There then comes a scene when another bestia breaks into the manor, and bestia, the actual bestia who's protecting the white-haired girl, kills bestia number two. We then switch and get Pauline's perspective. Pauline, looking for her lover Yukimasa, goes through and enters into the manor, searching for her lover, as then bestia kills Pauline revealing that Bestia was her lover Yukimasa all along. We even get a scene where you see Yukimasa on the ship and what went wrong, him murdering people one by one, showing that he was a bloodthirsty maniac who was simply suffering from a bit of the Joe Biden syndrome. And to pretty much sum up the ending, uh, the villagers go and attack the manor, killing the white-haired girl, and Bestia, or now revealed as Yukimasa, goes crazy and kills all the villagers. A man who had lost his memory of his previous lover, killing her, to save his newfound lover. Beauty, beauty, and the beast. Now, in comparison to all the doors, I think door two is the weakest. In concept, it has a lot of the things that I love. It's a psychological horror, it is dark, it's very brutal, and the reveal at the end with Pauline sticks with you and haunts you. And even though I think the mystery behind Bestia was cool, I, I don't think I was nearly as invested in the characters of this part nearly as much as door one and all of the doors that come afterwards. And I think this door is important not just because, well, it's necessary for the narrative of the story and things that will happen later or reveals that will be shown later, but I think door two did a great job of pulling me out of the investment that I had in door one, reminding me that there's more going on here than just the romantic dynamic between Mel and the white-haired girl, as the white-haired girl now appears again, a hundred years later, but only slightly older. The answers to those questions, again, we will have to see. But now this era closes, and we are taken on to the next.
Now, in door three is where I think Fata Morgana really takes a turning point, as even though I think door one and two are really good for their own reasons, I think from door three onwards we get introduced to the best characters in the entire series, one of them being Jacopo. The setting is 1869, around the time of the Industrial Revolution if I'm not mistaken. Technology is advancing heavily, people are making money left and right in any way that they can, and Jacopo is no exception. He will be serving as the protagonist of Door 3, and he is currently married to the white-haired girl once again. And if you've been wondering what's the soundtrack I've been using near the beginning of my videos, it's Ciao Carina, actually from this exact door. Bit of a smooth jazz sort of vibe, if you will. But regarding this part as a whole, uh, we end up following the relationship of Jacopo and the white-haired girl, more specifically Jacopo and his plans, the mystery regarding his backstory, as well as we're introduced to his maid, Maria, who seems to be the only friend and confidant he can trust in. That is due to the fact that Jacopo and Maria were once childhood friends and have now met up once again in this sort of scenario. Now, here's where things sort of uh, take a little bit of a twist. Uh, Jacopo is a piece of trash, absolute garbage. He treats his wife horribly. Right from the jump of this door, Jacopo's personality is made very clear to us, the audience. He's an extremely greedy and ambitious man who only finds validation, it seems, in the amount of success he can have. And that's due to his poor upbringing, something that we find out later on in the story. And it seems the only person trying to reconcile the relationship that's pretty damaged up to this point between Jacopo and the white-haired girl is Maria. She even makes an attempt to sort of get her ready and look nice for him, but yet he comes back early and completely flips out on her and then proceeds to lock the white-haired girl in a shed or basically a cottage. Now we see these events transpire through the perspective of the white-haired girl. Instantly you feel sympathy for her, you feel absolutely horrible for all of the things that's happening to her, and you feel an absolute hatred and disgust towards Jacopo. But things change once we get the perspective of Jacopo and the information he's been fed by Maria. False information that the white-haired girl has been sleeping and having affairs with other men. And it only becomes more and more painful once the white-haired girl is locked in the cottage because now the only one who's able to take her letters that she's been writing to Jacopo is Maria. And what she does throughout this entire segment is change the letters, removing Jacopo's name to make it seem like these letters are being written out to other men once Jacopo receives them. And so it's this really painful back and forth where the white-haired girl is writing her feelings onto this paper, expressing herself, her love and her desire to be with Jacopo, and yet by the time he receives the letters, he believes that this is for someone else. This is incredibly, brutally painful to sit through, and not because it's bad, but because it's heartbreaking in every way imaginable. And so instantly, Maria becomes a very hateable character, especially once we see her behind closed doors bragging and mocking the sad sentiments of the two people. And instantly, you start wondering about her motivations. What could have possibly happened between these two childhood friends to be separated and reunited for her to have such a hatred towards them? And that's really the mystery regarding this door is the history and the past of Maria and Jacopo. Uh, and admittedly, I don't think the twist and the mystery is as strong in this part as it is in 1 and 2, but regarding my investment in the characters as well as the pacing, I think Door 3 wins by a long shot. Now, something I didn't mention is a railroad is being completed, and once it's completed, there's going to be a huge celebration, and Jacopo is going to be a very, very, very rich man. And he decides on the day of that unveiling, if you will, the celebration, that he is going to go to the cottage and talk to the white-haired girl. But it's his inability to communicate, his prolonging of it, as well as his focus and his desires, his treatment of other people, which all ends up leading into his downfall. The story does slow down, it feels like, once we get into the past of Jacopo and Maria, as it's very simple. Just two childhood kids, not with the most amount of wealth, coming from two different families. Uh, presumably Italian, if I'm not mistaken, given the last names that they have. But upon the separation of the two of them, it's a little weird to think that they would ever have any sort of issues, considering how close they seem during this childhood state. However, Jacopo ends up giving her a gift which is basically a gun, a clip, and admittedly, it was a bit predictable where the ironic turn was going to be with this. I mean, you give someone a gun, and they're like, oh, don't worry, I'll make sure to return the favor. Like, oh, okay, yeah, I, I see where this is going. But throughout this, we get to see the breakdown of the white-haired girl, her holding on to hope that Jacopo will clear things up with her, that she will be with her husband once again and return to the happy time they had, like the one time he took her to a shop, and they had a very sweet moment together. Uh, but that doesn't end up happening, 
And uh, when Jacopo finally goes to talk to her and he opens the cottage, uh, he ends up reading a letter to her that she left. And that's when he realizes that the letters that he was getting were all for him. But who altered the letters? Who would do such a thing? And in his moment of distress, that's when Maria finally reveals herself to him, explaining that his family had basically screwed over her family, and now she was here for revenge. Maria shoots Jacopo, but then Jacopo pulls a Fano, saying you should have aimed for the head, and puts the bullet right between her eyes, killing Maria. Uh, the resolution stage of the story is essentially being told that Jacopo grows up to be old and alone with nobody. I think Door 3 is really a turning point with Fata Morgana, as now instead of just the mystery and the twists, we really get a strong sense of misunderstanding between characters, and a character that I find to be really well developed and fleshed out due to his flaws, and that's Jacopo. My favorite movie of all time is Scarface, so seeing a character's downfall due to his greed, his ambition, and some of his other personal flaws has always been a bit of a preference of mine. Uh, but seeing Jacopo's desire to be with the white-haired girl ruined due to his family history and the sabotaging of Maria, as well as his own personal mistakes, uh, him waiting too long to admit his feelings, and just simply just it being too late. Uh, I think Jacopo is an example, again, as we see with the conclusion of his character, him ending up alone, that chasing the wrong thing is um, can be costly. His short temper, his ambition to a fault, his greed, uh, his inability to really express himself properly. Uh, Jacopo, out of all the characters in the series, I think even going up to door eight is the one that I resonate with the most. And in the end, another door closes, and it's back to the manor. Even though I said door 3 in a regard was the turning point, I think doors 4, 5, 6, 7, and I mean really it could be said about all the doors coming after this. Now, door 4 we end up being taken back into the manor, still unsure about who we are and who the white haired girl is. Now seeing her reincarnated in 3 different time periods where it's impossible she could have lived that long, as well as we are still not sure of our own identity. Are we Mel? Are we Yukimasa? Are we Jacopo? Could we be the white haired girl? Honestly, at this point, all my guesses were up in the air, as well as who is Morgana. Uh, being a little bit familiar with the character Morgana Le Fay, uh, being an evil witch in other forms of media, my original guess going into door 4 was Morgana was actually the maid, being that she's the only one that has been throughout all of the events and goes out perfectly unscathed, as well as the fact that she has the green eyes, and green is usually a color you see the character Morgana Le Fay in. This time as we walk through the manor, still unaware of who we are, we end up encountering a painting, one swallowed in darkness, that tells us to be very weary of the events that happens in Door 4. Upon entering Door 4, we are taken back to 1099, presumably where the origin of all of this started, the curse of the manor, as well as the origin of Morgana, and who we are as well. As we enter door 4, we end up seeing the white-haired girl now running away from villagers who are chasing after her, and she ends up wandering into the estate, an estate that is occupied by a man known as Mikkel. And I'm going to refuse to jump the gun talking about him, but so, so yeah. We end up learning that he's been locked up in this place for a very, very long time, and that is due to the ability he has, or the curse that he has, that whoever he touches will die. And so we end up seeing the white-haired girl and Mikkel spend lots of time with each other, slowly but surely develop feelings for one another, and once again, this story has managed to get me invested in a relationship I know is not going to end well. Door 4 is the shortest of all the doors, but yet it does an amazing job of again getting me really invested between these two characters, as Michael, despite the fact that he is a little bit odd and clearly isolation has had its effects on him as a person, He's also someone who's really likable in this part, as well as the white-haired girl who we've seen suffer time and time again, as well as this seeming to be the answer to all of the mysteries regarding the story. But truly, it's seeing these two characters and learning about them that is really the grasp of Door 4, as seeing them slowly fall in love with each other really tugged at the heartstrings intensely, learning that the white-haired girl's name was Giselle. The dialogue in this part, as well as the doors afterwards, do a really great job of showing the personalities and the emotions of these characters, and it just gives you such a sentiment of hope, one that you know will shortly be snatched away. And it is when the villagers come back and break into the estate, and so uh, Mikkel and Giselle end up going up to like this tower area within the manor, and uh, in the final moments she desires to be embraced by him.
uh, but of course that will signify her death, but they both know they're going to die anyways. So she ends up dying in his arms, and in a last-ditch effort to protect her body, Mikkel gets killed outside of the door, which he locks her in. Uh, but, but then the, the real tragic thing happens as um, she doesn't die. She doesn't and uh, has to hear Mikkel be brutally murdered on the other side of the door, which she can't open. You know, I'd really love to have the meeting uh, with the writers. I, I, I just want to talk, you know? But once the dust settles and she basically cries out, uh, the, the maid appears, claiming to be Morgana, and promising her that one day she will be reunited with Mikkel once again. Now, door four is brutal, heartbreaking, and I found myself invested into this romance almost as quickly as I did Jacopo and the white-haired girl, now with the white-haired girl and Mikkel. However, there's one thing to remember about Door 4. Remember the painting I said, warning us about the events in Door 4, kind of alluding it to a fairy tale? Uh, yeah, Door 4 is a lie. What happens in Door 4 is partially true, but a lot of the things are exaggerated and some of the people are not who they actually are. For example, the white-haired girl wasn't in that at all. Giselle is indeed in door 4, or in the events that happens in door 4, but Giselle is not the white-haired girl. Giselle is actually the maid. So the relationship and the love dynamic we see isn't between the white-haired girl and Mikkel, but if not Giselle, who's the maid, and Mikkel. And it turns out us, we, the main character the whole time, the person we've been trying to figure out regarding who we are, is Mikkel. So, to sort of make things clear in case it was confusing, we are Mikkel. That's the person we've been trying to figure out the whole time. The maid was actually Giselle. So now the mystery is, is how did Giselle end up being the maid of the manor, living through all these different time periods, and watching all these horrendous things happening, and why? And if the maid is Giselle and not Morgana, then who is Morgana? And what took place between Giselle and Mikkel to the point that both of their souls seem to be lost? Or well, Giselle has been in the manor while Mikkel has been gone and has found his way back. And how much of Door 4 is actually true? You see, it really is like a fairy tale. Because although there are supernatural elements in House and Fata Morgana, a man who kills people solely off of touch was truly fairy tale like It was like a Greek tragedy. And in retrospect, you can pick that up a little bit. But now we enter Door 5 and we see the events that actually transpired in 1099. Now, events that happen through doors 1 and 4 are very serious and can be dark, but door 5 and onward is where it really delves into some topics that can be extremely sensitive. As in door 5, we find out the origin of how Giselle ends up at the manor in which Mikkel is staying at and why Mikkel is also there, although a grand majority of Mikkel's past is kept a secret to us until it is revealed later on in Door 7. And what's really brilliant about it is all of those things that eventually is revealed to us in Door 7 is being layered all the way back since this door, as we get little hints here and there about a secret Mikkel is keeping about himself, as well as the actual reason as to why he stayed here. Now, Giselle previously, before arriving at the manor and meeting Mikkel, was a maid at Mikkel's estate. Their first interaction not really going too smooth as Mikkel holds her to knife point, and for some reason Giselle is in complete utter shock at Mikkel doing such a thing and is incapable of answering his questions. And what's brilliant about this interaction here, as later we end up finding out, is they both have their reasons for their reaction both originating back at the original estate, which both Mikkel and Giselle were at at different points. So they start off uh, very bumpy, to put it lightly, and yet, however, things transpire like they do in Door 4, but this time we actually get to see it happen for real. The development and the love relationship between Giselle and Mikkel, as they both open up to each other more and more, Mikkel first being very distanced from her and keeping her away which again is given much justification in Door 7, but Giselle has a desire to get closer to him, uh, although his personality can be very cold at times. And so again, as in Door 4, we see the relationship between these two grow more, and we even get an explanation as to why Giselle froze up so much when Mikkel held her at knife point. What was the great fear? And it's when she reveals to him in a very heartfelt, uh, emotional, and powerful scene that it was Mikkel's own father that used to do very atrocious things to her. You see, before arriving here, Giselle used to be a maid at the estate, uh, at the estate where Mikkel's family is from, and she was frequently the victim of all sorts of abuse, sexual assault, and rape at the hands of Mikkel's very own father, Antonin. 
and he used to like carving things into her, which is the reason why when Mikhail held her at knife point, uh, she freaked out. And to make matters even worse, word started to spread about the affair between the two. And so in order to save the reputation of the family, more specifically Antonin, she was sent off to the manor where previously they had the outcasted son Mikhail sent as well. And Mikhail had been receiving letters from his mother talking about her negatively. And so that explains the paranoia he had regarding Giselle. So it's all one big misunderstanding, but misunderstanding and applying that to dialogue and scenarios really helps make dialogue feel much more not only realistic, but believable, as some of the biggest conflicts when you look at it time and time again is due to a misunderstanding. And things aren't cleared up until we finally get the perspective of the other individual. And so door five is really Giselle's door, all about exploring her character and her past and how she got to meet Mikkel. However, Mikkel himself is still one big mystery. What is the secret that he's keeping? Why did they banish him from the family and send him to this manor to be isolated for all these years in the first place? And that's something that stays in the back of our mind despite the immense investment we have between these two characters. But yet there's an aspect of Mikkel that doesn't fully let her in. And as I said in Door 4, some things are exaggerated. Mikkel does not kill people upon touch, although he has been banished to this manor for a good amount of years now. And Giselle's whole backstory I just got into. Uh, but what is true is the fate of these two characters as this time uh, it wasn't the villagers that the white-haired girl was running from that broke into the manor, but if not, uh, some knights appear at the manor, and uh, they seem to be after Mikkel, so they end up going up into the tower, and once again, Mikkel locks up instead of the white-haired girl, actually it was Giselle who was locked in the tower as Mikkel dies on the other side of it. And we don't really get to see the perspective from his point of view, but if not Giselle's point of view, which again is why you could look at Door 5 as Giselle being the primary character in this one. And uh, it, it's truly tragic and sad, uh, but Giselle gets promised that she will be able to see him again if she accepts the deal and essentially becomes the maid of the manor. And so we are still left with the mystery of who Morgana is and why she's doing all of this, but now we know how Giselle met Mikkel and how Giselle became the maid. And now Mikkel once again is reunited with her, but under very different circumstances. And so despite the huge answers we get, now getting the picture painted in front of us a little more clearly, there's still some massive questions to be asked. What did Giselle do after this and before door one? What was she doing through doors one through three? The development and change of her personality from Giselle to the maid, as well as the origin of Morgana. Still some massive questions along with the secret of Mikkel. As I said, Mikkel's character will be dealt more in door seven, but in door six, we get the answers to the maid, as well as the origin of the true mastermind behind all of this. Now, in their own regards, I view doors 5, 6, 7, and 8 as 10 out of 10s for various different reasons, just because I think each of those doors expands upon the characters in ways that honestly just completely triumphs over what doors 1, 2, and 3 were able to do, although that's no slight to those first three doors, as I think they do a great job of setting up and are much better upon retrospect. It's extremely difficult to choose my favorite one out of doors 6, 7, and 8. It's kind of like Berserk with the Millennium Falcon, Golden Age, and Conviction arc. It really depends on what day you ask me, but on most days, if you asked me what my favorite door is, it would be door 6. Which is saying a lot because door 7 is what really makes Mikkel as a character one of the best I've ever read, and Door 8 is probably the best conclusion to a story I've ever read, period. But in Door 6, we finally start to fill in the gaps as to everything that led up to Doors 1, 2, and 3. Again, as I said, Giselle becoming the maid after making a deal with Morgana once Mikkel was killed outside of the door, and we get to see her through her time in the manor. In fact, we even get to see her serving the grandfather of Mel and Nelly before he ends up tragically passing away as well. What makes it really impactful is seeing how Giselle changed from this bright and cheery person in which she was established established in door 5 despite the horrible things she went through and that contrasting Mikkel's more reserved nature. But as the maid, she turns into this cold servant of the manor under Morgana, even assisting Yukimasa in all of these horrid atrocities if you remember back to door 2. The centuries in which she waited for Mikkel to return again and again and again, but he never did up till now, 
robbed her of her humanity. And all of these little things are subtly hinted at us in door one, two, and three every time the maid shows up, the mystery regarding her. And I think doors five and six really expand upon Giselle's character and the immense satisfaction of watching these layers be peeled back to the point that I throw her up there amongst the best characters I've read. Especially when we have this heartfelt scene through door six when Giselle's confessing all of this to Mikkel and Mikkel says that despite her change in appearance and maybe some of the things she's done, that she's still deep down the Giselle that he loves. Now, the soundtracks in 1, 2, and 3, again, especially 3, I find to be very good, but 5, 6, 7, and 8, but specifically 5 and 6, man, they start hitting hard emotionally. Oh my goodness. But then Morgana shows up to ruin the moment, taking Giselle away, and in order to enter the tower, uh, Mikkel needs to get three keys. And so he wanders through the manor again, and uh, he encounters someone in a rose garden, um, but someone with a very similar silhouette to Mel, if that seems very familiar. And then goes down to the cellar, where if you remember, the maid found Bestia. And then he finds a pool table, which uh, should sound familiar if you read Door 3. So, slowly but surely, the story is going to start making connections to the first three doors and what this all has to do with Morgana, in which now Giselle and Mikkel end up tied up in this whole mess. But after Mikkel manages to do so, he ends up climbing up the stairs which lead up to the tower, the same tower where he was originally killed while Giselle was locked inside of the room, crying out. And as he does so, the witch talks to Mikkel, and this is when we enter my favorite stretch in door six by far and that is morgana's story now i was really planning going more into mikkel's character in door seven however it, i should bring this up because it's important to the context but it's something that's uh, made clear in doors five and six and that is despite mikkel's isolation and the secret he's hiding it, he isn't the typical representation i feel like of an isolated character which is bitter and rude and mean if not mikkel comes off as a little more again a little more socially distant but yet he's still someone who's very empathetic and so Mikkel's personality as a character is really well fleshed out in Doors 5 and 6, but I think 7 really drives it home. But I, I bring that up in this specific context because as Mikkel climbs the stairs more and more, he will start to feel the pain from Morgana's story, her origin how she came to be, and why she's really doing all of this. Although, again, uh, in the House of Fata Morgana, it, it really likes to leave gaps there for other people's perspective to fill in. So just keep that in mind. But as Morgana retells her story, she says that her fate was decided before she was even born, unaware if this woman had done this for money, fame, or other purpose. And as she begins to retell her story is when we get my favorite soundtrack in the entire series. Sanctus. You don't know how badly I'm tempted to just insert the entire segment in this video, but I can't do that because honestly, no amount of retelling that I'm going to do is going to do justice to this story, especially this segment right here. I mean, truly. Uh, but to sort of summarize, um, basically, Morgana's uh, mother, if you will, sort of claims that Morgana is a saint and that her blood has uh, healing properties. And so the people come to her and partake of her blood in order to be healed by these illnesses. And if you know anything about bloodborne, medieval times, or really just basic health in general, uh, that's a horrid idea. And if somebody wasn't healed from her blood, they would say, this isn't the fault of the daughter of God, you just simply didn't have enough faith. Long story short, Morgana is taken into the hands of a lord and uh, he's basically like, hey, you're gonna perform miracles for me. However, he likes to show off at parties often, and so, uh, it, okay, l l l let me see if you could put it together. Say somebody frequently wants someone to perform miracles, but in order to do those miracles, you have to cut them open uh, so th their blood can be used. Yeah, uh, let's just say Morgana is left a bloodied, horrified mess and scar. Did I also mention she's just a little girl when all of this happens to her? Yeah, no, nah, it's it's really brutal, and the way that it's described in, in the telling is very, very vivid. Uh, and we then flash back to Mikkel, who is getting the cuts on him. Like I said, he's feeling her pain, but he has to continue walking further and further up the steps. And before telling her story, Morgana stated that she was nothing more than an ordinary human deemed a saint but now due to her horrifying image 
is called a witch. I mean, really, the way that they described flesh falling off of her face and just, uh, oh, uh, 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 But eventually, there's a rebellion by the slaves there at the Lord's place, and she finds herself in a brothel before eventually that brothel is overrun by thieves once again, and she's taken hostage, and as she's carried on into a carriage full of other slaves, uh, somebody appears, stops the carriage, and begins to kill everyone in the carriage. Someone who seems to be possessed by this brutal need to just kill more and more and more. A monster who seems to take sadistic pleasure in doing so. If that sounds familiar to you, then you're probably thinking of the right person in the story. Alas, the man does not kill Morgana if not leaves her to witness the atrocity he commits until one day she eventually stumbles upon a cottage and uh, things end up happening where she ends up meeting a flaxen-haired young man. If that sounds familiar, again, it should. He goes to the cottage that she's in saying that his sister has fallen very, very ill and he needs her help. And so, out of the kindness of her heart, despite everything she's gone through, Morgana once again opens up and offers help to the flaxen-haired young man. Now, before I continue on with that, actually, let's take it back to the brothel, because there was someone else at the brothel, one who took care of her, and someone else who would frequently help rub ointments on her and all of that, and in fact, even gave her uh, something to keep before the thieves broke in and things went to hell. But going back to the flaxen-haired young man, things between her and him actually go pretty well. In fact, she says she was even willing to give out blood whenever needed when his sister's condition got worse. But she notes something in his eyes, something different. He looked like he was a bit at discomfort. Guilty. And eventually, the flaxen-haired young man stops really being able to look at her, and eventually stops showing up. But one day she gets a new visitor that knocks on her cottage, asking if she's the witch with the magical blood. And it instantly goes through her mind. How did he know that I had powers? Why did he call me a witch? And why did this man sound like the exact person who slaughtered all of the other slaves in that carriage? That's because it was the same man. Now, of course, she tells the man he has to leave, uh, turning a murderer down like him, and he leaves. And the, eventually, three days later, the flaxen-haired boy shows up once again saying that he wanted to talk to her. And it's really, really emotional how she describes him as like a sunlight to her, being one of the only positive things in her life, one of the only things that brought him joy. And when she opens the door, uh, the man that she had just turned down, the guy who had murdered all of the slaves, was there with him. And in a swift motion, cuts her arm off. Long story short, the flaxen-haired young man who was once sunlight to Morgana and the man who had killed all the slaves in the carriage were working for the lord that she had escaped from before ending up at the brothel. At least that's how it is from her perspective, again keep that in mind. Now she's locked up in a tower to be used once again for miracle blood at this church which is now the manner in which the maid has been taken care of this entire time. Which is why, again, sometimes it hints to certain rooms, specifically the room with the glass-stained angel on it, and the tower as well. Which is where Morgana was originally locked up in. The same room in the tower where Mikkel would die outside of, and Giselle would cry for help on the inside. Hence why Morgana was able to make an offer. But there's still some things missing, but we'll get to that. Now, remember, the story this whole time has been building up Morgana as the one responsible for all of the horrible things that we see happen in doors 1, 2, and 3, as well as doing a horrid deal with Giselle. She's clearly set up as the antagonistic force, but yet then she asks a question to Mikkel, but to also us, the audience, hearing her story up to this point. How could I not hold a grudge? How could I not despise them? How could I possibly forgive them? Tell me, please. Tell me. How could I? Is there any answer that Mikkel can offer? Anything that Mikkel has gone through to where he could justifiably say, I understand you? And again, we have to wait till door seven. But this church, which is being run by this lord, uh, is essentially lying to the people, saying that this saint who works there, it's her church and the blood is her blood, which is miracle blood, which in fact, it's witch's blood, or Morgana's blood. But of course, they can't tell the people that because it would be a whole scandal knowing that they were drinking blood of a witch. Really imagine how horrible this is for Morgana. Being told that she was a saint from when she was a little girl, being lied to like that, being taken advantage of, 
in the hands of a lord who absolutely destroys her body and physical appearance, has to witness the horrible murders of other slaves inside of a carriage, goes off into a cottage, finds someone that she feels like she can finally open up to and feel comfort around, but yet he betrays her along with the man of the carriage just to take her back to the lord, who's now using someone else who's called a saintess. And so, Morgana, yeah, no, Mor Morgana's rightfully furious. And so, she's not already a bloodied, beaten pulp, uh... But she, she also is missing an arm. And if I'm not mistaken, she's only like 14 years old at the time. Mind you, this would still be horrible for an adult to go through. But for someone so young to go through all of this, yeah, uh, Guts, you got some competition, my boy. And so they keep her locked up in this observation tower, using her blood to heal the city in this elixir. And uh, the thing is, is in this observation tower, in order to get in, there are three locks, three keys. One belonging to a flaxen-haired young man one belonging to the swordsman, and the final one belonging to the greedy lord. Are you making the connections yet? Because as soon as I did, oh man, I was losing it. But then the question is, if these three existed during her time, then how is it that they're back once again in their own respective time periods, which we end up visiting in doors one, two, and three? Well, that's yet to be seen. And the day eventually came where there was essentially a festival and she heard the voice of the saintist, the swordsman, the lord, the flaxen-haired boy and his sister, all these happy voices, and then the bells began to ring. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And Morgana says, and with the twelfth chime, I died. Truly a horrid and tragic life for Morgana. The door opens and the three men are there, presumably to take more blood, but then Morgana puts it all into question. Did I really have the ability to heal people with my blood, or was it just simply the illusion of belief? However, things go horrid as in this feast, the flaxen-haired boy's younger sister drops dead, and he screams out, lashing out that they are all drinking witch's blood. The only family member he had left, the flaxen-haired young man, would pick up a fork and stab it into his own throat killing himself. Then the swordsman was outnumbered and killed by the people who were in an outrage, and eventually it would be the Lord's turn. Then a plague eventually befell the city, and as you can imagine, Morgana's spirit was left to curse those men and curse the manor. What was once seen as the power of a saint she now sees as a curse, but yet her anger, her hatred was not sated. They died, but so what? Even in death, for her their death was not enough. She wanted more. And so she ended up making her next wish. She wished for their reconstruction, their eternal suffering on their souls. She wanted to entrap them in a never-ending cycle of pain and hatred. For the flaxen-haired young man, he only cared about having a quiet life and caring about his dear sister. So she wished that his sister would love him more than anything in the world. For his world to be destroyed by love gone too far. For the swordsman or the beast-like man, she knew that he was very conscious of his tendency for violence and he wanted to be more human. So, she wished that his inner beast would be toned up more, and saw that he would never be human, so he would never have the peace he desired. And for the Lord, she had wished that his affection for wealth and authority would be the only things he would ever have. No love, no friendship. So once he had lost everything, his only companion would be solitude. Do you see it now? Do you see how this all goes back to doors one, two, and three? This whole time, this was being built in front of your eyes, and you had no idea. This next quote is very important for the series, as Morgana says, wishes can come true, as long as you always hold fast, never stop wishing, never surrender. They can come true. This applying to Morgana's hateful, vengeful wish against the three souls which had done this to her, as well as Giselle's wish to be once again reunited with Mikkel. We are then taken into the present time where Mikkel has stumbled on the tower steps, uh, due to the excruciating physical pain after being asked by Morgana if he would curse them with her. And through the pain and the suffering, the excruciating, horrible feelings he can he can just sense. He, he's being tempted by Morgana to just give up, be he refuses to, because he wants to have Giselle, the love of his life, at his side. And through his persistence, Mikkel makes it to the top of the tower, screaming out to Morgana, saying that he feels her pain, and that he too felt a hatred for those three men. But regardless, he cannot stop his journey in moving forward for Giselle's sake. Again, such noble characteristics was not something I would have expected from the way Mikkel is introduced to us in Door 4, but in reality in Door 5. Morgana even offers him to be with Giselle forever along with her in cursing and torturing these three men, 
be it Mikhail declined, saying that hatred will only bring you pain. Which is very noble because I would have taken that deal. Now, I failed to mention this, but there's also something in Door 5 that we see, and that is occasionally there are times where Mikhail will tell someone to shut up. And he even confesses to Giselle that sometimes he feels as if though something in the manor is talking to him. That was Morgana the whole time. You see, Giselle had been locked up in this place, isolated from his family, this area which had been inhabited by Morgana's spirit. And so, he, he even confesses that he felt bad for not taking the time to ask her about any of this. Which, again, despite everything Morgana has caused him and Giselle to really suffer through, just as a result of what she's trying to do to these three other people, again, shows truly how, how great of a person Mikkel truly is. Now, he pushes the door open, but now he's taken to the bedroom where he sees Giselle, and he's wondering what's going on. And this is where we get another major revelation. Remember, through all of this, there's one person I failed to mention, and that is the white-haired girl. Who is the white-haired girl? And well, Morgana says that every time Mikkel is returned, he's returned as the white-haired girl. And the reason Mikkel didn't want to take things a step further with Giselle, as well as the secret that he was keeping from her, was the fact that, um... He doesn't have a slong. Okay, yeah, look, alright, look, I know at this point you might be asking yourselves a lot of questions. I was too, uh, and I was, I was a little bit... Uh, confused by it, but all of this will be explained in Door 7. Just stick with it, and also keep in mind that not everything Morgana says can be trustworthy, and this version of Giselle essentially says that she saw the letter that the mother had sent to Mikkel calling Mikkel her daughter, and saying that Mikkel's not really a man, and that she's disgusted. At, at this point, look, I had many, many, many questions, very confused, and if really this whole time Mikkel was reincarnating as the white-haired girl, but if that was the case, then why would the white-haired girl be returning to the flaxen-haired young man, the swordsman, and then the lord? Why would that be the thing if the white-haired girl was the catalyst to the detriment of those three individuals? And so, yeah, no, I was very, very, very confused. But all of that will be answered in Door 7. In Door 7, we finally get the backstory to our protagonist, Mikkel. And Mikkel's backstory is really tragic, it's really heartfelt, and it's one that really gives a lot of explanation to his behaviors in Doors 5 and 6. We get a deeper look into his family, uh, already knowing about Antonin regarding what he was doing to Giselle, but we also get to meet his mother and his two older brothers, Georges and Didier. And as for Mikkel at the time, we see him as a little girl called Michelle. Okay. Here's well I'll explain it because it'll make the rest of this door a lot easier to follow with. So when Mikkel was born, uh, he was born as 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 a guy, but he just doesn't have a slong. What do you mean by that? Not that he was born with female reproductive organs and see, no, like he, he he's a guy. He just due to some freak incident, he just doesn't have a penis. And so because of this, Mikkel was raised as a girl, Michelle, despite actually being a boy the entire time. And you see this throughout the story where he expresses his desires to do manly things along with his brothers, but yet is forced to act a certain way because, well, the mother thinks that he's a girl. And so, as you can imagine, this causes a lot of conflict for Mikkel, who's known as Michelle in the moment, as well as a weird dynamic with the rest of the family and his older brothers, Georges, this famous painter, and his eldest brother, Didier, who's a knight. But things remain relatively smooth despite Mikkel's own frustrations. This all changes, however, when Mikkel grows up and puberty hits. And this is when we get the confirmation that, yes, Mikkel was, in fact, a dude the entire time because as he grows up, his voice gets deeper and his frame becomes more of a man as puberty hits. And sadly, because of this, this causes the whole dynamic of his relationship with the family to change as the mother now sees him as a curse and has him locked away within the family estate. And it was also shown earlier that Mikkel was developing feelings for a girl who was already promised to one of his brothers and she ends up turning out to be his tormentor, frequently doing all sorts of abuses to him and him being incapable to really fight back, absolutely destroying him on every level possible 
comfortable even poking at the fact that he's not really a complete man for not having a penis. Really, these scenes are absolutely heartbreaking, seeing how much of a gentle soul Mikkel really is, and to see him go through all of this when none of it was really his fault in the first place is really a tragic thing to witness. And it would really explain why he held Giselle at knife point and sort of his paranoia due to the abuse that he would suffer during his time here. As well as all of the shame he would feel and the reason he would want to keep it a secret, him being seen as a freak of nature, despite again none of it really being his own fault. Eventually he's taken to what would be the manor, which all of the other doors take place in, by his brothers Georges and Didier to sort of protect him, and even sent an individual who was hired by the family to live in a shed nearby, which is something that we were shown in one of the previous doors, who would eventually take all sorts of packages to the front of the manor in order to make sure Mikkel had stuff to eat and all of that. All of this to protect his life. And so then we get into Mikkel's perspective from his time in isolation, him meeting Morgana and hearing her spirit in the manor, and then eventually him meeting Giselle. Now there's something I want to state here because it is of grand importance, and that is the relationship Mikkel has with his brothers, which to him is the tightest bond he has with his family, especially with his eldest brother Didier, having great respect and admiration for him being a knight, and Mikkel's own dream wanting to be a knight one day, but of course due to the complications of his childhood, uh, that that wouldn't be possible. And remember what I said earlier about Fata Morgana doing an amazing job of layering its story through perspectives? Well, as we know in the previous doors, Mikkel would die locking Giselle in the watchtower room in order to protect her and him being killed like that. Well, when we see it from his perspective, it turns out the knights that were sent there were sent by Mikkel's own mother, and the one leading the knights was his oldest brother Didier only making the tale even more tragic. It's incredibly heartbreaking. I mean, really, I felt absolutely heart-wrenched reading and sitting through this, seeing Mikkel's very own flesh and blood treat him in such a manner, and it, it explaining a lot of the empathy he could feel for Morgana, but it's taken even further, and I think the nail in the coffin that truly made this part for me was seeing Mikkel, or well, Mikkel's spirit, look at his own corpse, as he was able to see the way that it was treated and the way that his own mother would speak about him, calling him a curse, and all sorts of other atrocious things. And Mikkel would have been absolutely lost in the darkness if it wasn't for Giselle reaching out to him to pull him out of all of this, calling out Morgana for her lies, saying that the white-haired girl was never Mikkel at all, and Mikkel was his own person, and that despite all that he has suffered, Giselle accepts Mikkel for who he is. This man went through years upon years worth of isolation, has no penis, and still pulled a girl. You have no excuses whatsoever. I think Door 7 was a beautiful demonstration of Mikkel's past and his character, one that I think was allowed to be as impactful as it was due to the structure of Morgana and the way that his character was slowly being peeled back through doors four through six. Slowly becoming more aware of his personality and how complex it is, especially once we get to see his perspective and what he truly went through, explaining his reactions to Giselle, his secluded nature and the real reason behind that, as well as his reason and his cause to be able to sympathize with Morgana's pain. I think showing the effects of prolonged isolation, as well as the struggle of regaining one's trust in another person, is incredibly well presented in Fata Morgana, and really well portrayed in all of its nuances through Mikkel's personality, along with all of the other pains and struggles he went through, without just coming off as the bitter cliche that I tend to see with a character who it comes off as a bit of a closed in person. He can come off as cold and a bit too brutally honest, but then you get to see more of his awkward innocent side and somebody who lives with a lot of shame despite, again, none of it really being his fault. But he's somebody that despite all he went through is incredibly understanding and empathetic. Now this is just my personal subjective opinion, but I personally don't have Mikkel over a character like Guts. For me, I, I still think Guts is the best protagonist I've had the pleasure of seeing within a story. However, I think the highest praise I could give Mikkel is if somebody were to say, I have Mikkel over Guts, I would be perfectly okay with it. And and you have every reason to think that. And so now with Mikkel and Giselle together in some sort of way, although not fully together once again, they now get to go back into the past where it all started and prevent the tragic day and the death of Morgana, hoping that they'll be able to free themselves from this and one day truly be reunited together. But yet one question remains. If Mikkel wasn't the white-haired girl, then who was? Well, to answer all that, we need to go into the final door, Door 8. At the beginning of Door 8, we see different pieces of dialogue from different characters that will be important throughout all of this. And after that, we end up getting a prompt that says, 
three days until her death. Mikkel has been taken back into the past three days before the tragic event that happened at the end of Door 6, where Morgana dies, and it's revealed to everyone that they were drinking her blood. And so Mikkel will be doing his best efforts in order to prevent that tragic day from happening, in order to free himself from this nightmare him and Giselle have been caught in. Now, luckily, during this door, Giselle is with Mikkel, but not physically. Instead, she's like a voice in his head that he can hear, and that talks to him and keeps him company. Now, as we know, there are three keys in order to unlock the door in which Morgana is being held captive in. And so, Mikkel's going to have to do his best uh, to carefully convince each of these three men to hand over their keys in order to free Morgana. And one of these three is going to be much easier to convince than the other two, and that is Mel. So, Mikkel essentially is direct with Mel. At first, it's a little weird him having to explain who he is and lie about it because he can't really tell them uh, that, you know, he's from the future and has come back into the past, at least at first, but eventually comes clean to Mel and sort of provokes the guilt in him seeing that mel deep down is still somebody who feels remorse for all of his actions and mel is someone that eventually uh goes on mikkel's side and agrees with him now despite how easy i made that sound there's still an immense amount of tension felt throughout all of this because at any turn at any moment this could all go horribly south especially when the other two men get involved uh the swordsman and the lord and the second key which they need to get is from the swordsman however that one is going to be a lot trickier considering his aggressive and killing nature which has been made very clear not only way back in door two but in door six when morgana speaks of it. now previously when mikkel had to convince mel uh, to do the right thing nelly had to be involved so in order to convince the swordsman here uh we would end up meeting the saintess of this church the one that was actually being uh, deemed of the the blood that was being used uh and that's actually the original version of pauline now she claims that's not her actual name however later on when we meet maria or the original version of maria goes on to reveal that is indeed her real name and she's simply been using another one as she's been under the church However, eventually through that and through the relationship we see that is actually between the two characters, the swordsman and the saintess. But even that takes a decent amount of time as there's even a scene that's incredibly tense where Mel, Mikkel, and the swordsman all have a meeting. And the swordsman basically interrogates the both of them in a sort of way, even pushing Mel to very uncomfortable lengths with some of the questions that he asks. Now, this door is by far the longest, but throughout all of this, it's been able to maintain attention, be it the previous knowledge that we know of what's at stake, as well as the dialogue that's used in this door and the personalities at hand. And it all comes to a climax with the second key, at least, when Mikkel and the swordsman are in a cellar, and essentially the swordsman goes on further with interrogation, uh, breaking Mikkel's fingers one by one, asking who he really is and why he's really here, and he won't accept the answer that Mikkel is giving him, uh, very similar to sort of what happened back in Door 2 when you witnessed Yukimasa on the boat doing a very similar thing to one of the shipmates. Uh, however, Mikkel is saved when Pauline and Mel show up, and uh, he, the swordsman is stopped because, as, as you can imagine, Pauline is pretty much the only thing sort of keeping onto that man's humanity. Although the real reason as to why she was brought there by Mel was so that she could hear the truth of what's actually going on, and that's that they have Morgana captive and have been using her blood instead. So, with all of that transpiring, uh, eventually they get the second key from the swordsman. And afterwards, we get the perspective from the swordsman and how he came to be the person he was, what he went through, working essentially as a slave himself, and how that dark time in his life eventually corroded away at his humanity, turning him into the man he is with the current predicament that he has. It's really moments like this in Door 8 that I think really allow the door overall to be as remarkable as it was, but I'll get into that at the end of the video. So now we have the first two keys. The issue is the third one, the Lord. The person who had tortured Morgana now on two separate occasions and was the sort of the orchestrator behind all of this. Now, as the door continues on, we continue to see their perspective on how things transpired and the deals that eventually Yukimasa, or well, the swordsman in this door, would end up making with the Lord and how the Lord ended up planning everything that ends up happening. And it's one of those things where, once again, we get to see Mikkel's forgiveness uh, sort of 
brought to the test again and again and again as we are told the story of the swordsman. Meanwhile, the time gets closer and closer to Morgana's death. And in order to get the final key, uh, the three of them, now Mel, Mikkel, and the swordsman, all team up deciding to sort of corner the Lord and pretty much convince him, hey, we're, we're going to get your key one way or another. And his attitude, as expected, is very stubborn. He's going to be the most difficult of all the three in order to get the final key for. However, this is when we end up getting the biggest twist regarding the Lord's character in Door 8. Now, this is very important and part of the reason why I went extensively in Door 6 on Morgana's past, just because it's really the central point that sort of ties all of these things together. And that is, at first, when Morgana was taken by the Lord, and then eventually she escaped and lived at a brothel for a bit, and in that brothel there was someone who took care of her and, you know, patched her up and all that and with, with the ointment, and then eventually, now again, she was taken in captive of the Lord, this time at the church or, well, the manor. Well, it turns out that the Lord isn't the same person the first time and the second time. In fact, what actually happened was the Lord this time around was the man who took care of her while she was in the brothel. It was Jacopo, the man who had developed feelings for Morgana while taking care of her in the brothel, ended up overtaking the Lord and taking his place. So then when Morgana was brought to Jacopo, he was really in denial about the whole situation and Morgana didn't even recognize him in her hatred confusing him with the original Lord who had taken her back before they had even met. This series has had some twists, some that I've predicted, others that I somewhat saw coming, but in the execution caught me off guard. This, on the other hand, was probably by far my favorite twist in the entire series, one that only added so much more to the character of the Lord and this version of Jacopo that we witnessed. Being a mirror to what we saw in Door 3, someone who at first we believed to be solely this cold-hearted evil person only then to witness his perspective and see that he's more than that if not he's truly a tragic character the personality traits that he has that are sort of his reason to rise to success be it in door three or what we end up seeing here in door eight are the very same personality traits that are the cause to his detriment and his failure regarding his relationship with morgana and with his past exposed now jacopo or the lord has no other option but to give up his final key and they hurry up to free Morgana, hoping to save her from her fate, only to arrive there to have witnessed her dead anyways, as Mikkel came here not to really change the past, but to simply witness it. And all Mikkel can do is hold the dying Morgana in his arms, as she then asks him if he's an angel, to which he says yes. And meanwhile, Jacopo is confessing his feelings to Morgana, who he really was, and his love for her. At this moment, when I was reading this, I thought that like there was a crack in the ceiling and rain from outside was dropping on my phone. Uh, nah, it, I, it was just tears. However, there is something that's very important to mention, and that is when they first opened the cellar and witnessed Morgana, she was talking to herself. In fact, her mind had split in two from the suffering that she had gone through, and a version of her had came up with the story about someone sending letters and that person coming on to save them. Which if you remember, that's the same story the white-haired girl was telling Mel in the library way back in door one. But to add into the tragedy even more, it turns out that all of these conversations, everything that Mikkel has been going through with the swordsman, with Mel, and with the Lord, or with Jacopo, none of it's been real. It was all an illusion, and that he didn't change the past at all. He just simply witnessed it, showing that he can't change the past, but if not has to face Morgana in the present, and so Mikkel has to go back. But instead, his soul is pulled into a specific place by the white-haired girl, revealing that the white-haired girl was indeed Morgana. Or well, as I said earlier, Morgana's suffering was so great that she couldn't really cope with it all, and her hatred for these people, and so she split into two people, Morgana and the white-haired girl. The white-haired girl being the embodiment of all of her positive traits and her purity, which explains why she was that way in Doors 1, 2, and 3, despite all of the horrible things that were happening to her. And as a sign of respect, she formed her own appearance after Mikkel, sort of empathizing with everything he went through in a way, and uh, she requests to, uh, to have Mikkel kill her in order for Morgana's soul to be healed and complete again. 
in which he does that and then him and Morgana get into a very emotional back and forth where he reveals the truth about who the Lord really was forcing Morgana to really come to terms with all of that. And so we see Morgana and Mikhail go and talk to the three souls, Mel, the swordsman, and Jacopo, and them having words for her as well as her having final words for them. And it's really the interaction between her and Jacopo that again is the most heartfelt. And even though it's medieval times, uh, the uh, relationship between these two is uh, definitely questionable. And we even get the revelation that the painting that had warned Mikkel back in door four was actually his older brother Georges the entire time. And so seeing this more human side to Morgana and the interaction she has with Mikkel and Georges is something that really put a smile on my face and only further solidified Morgana's entire sort of thing as a character where as an antagonist, she's incredibly sympathetic. And that's not due to a morally gray philosophy, but what I find to be a key thing in a really well done sympathetic antagonist is seeing things from their perspective and giving a legitimate justification to all of the atrocious actions they end up committing. Again, not really justifying said actions, but if not creating a logical path we can follow in order to emotionally connect as to how they got there. Eventually, Mikkel has to come to grips with his own past once again, being confronted by Didier and having to fight through that and find closure in that experience as well. And the message of the story really starts to shine through in this final part in Door 8, where we get to see these two characters who have gone through arguably the worst that a person could experience, letting go, finding closure, and moving on from the past. And I think it's really powerful seeing Mikkel forgive and find closure and everything that Morgana did to him whilst also helping her find closure in all of the stuff that happened to her. Door 8 really goes into lengths and in showing the different types of hatred one can bear, be it towards others or towards oneself, and the importance of moving on from all of that, sort of being symbolized in the manner and the souls repeatedly coming back to this place. Even being shown with them having to bring Didier to his senses in order to allow him to peacefully move on and once again Morgana finding closure and freeing the souls uh, from their torment despite not exactly forgiving them for their actions and eventually as the mansion uh, or the manor disappears we see Giselle crying out to Mikkel to not disappear on her and uh, upon cycles and cycles time goes on until finally in more modern times we see Giselle and Mikkel finally reunited at last. Uh, I, I, I don't think I cried any harder at, at anything else than the conclusion of Dora 8. Romances hit me pretty hard and this one hit me the hardest uh, out of any other that I've ever read. Just sort of closure and moving on from the past has always been something very personal to me. Uh, so uh, in a weird way there is something about this story that resonated with me on a deeper level than I think any other story that I've read. But that's a very personal and subjective thing so I understand if that's not the same for everybody. However, I do think all of Fata Morgana is brilliantly constructed as an illusion within an illusion. Sort of pulling you in close in door one to what's happening in that specific moment, but as each door goes on and on and on, you notice that it's simply a reflection of a much larger thing being at play the entire time. Although the story does like to take its time, I think the payoffs and all of the different twists and the different mysteries, the characters that end up building up, and the way that it does it again through perspectives and subtlety through dialogue, I found to be incredibly satisfying. I think when it came to mystery, when it came to romance, tragedy, everything that it sort of tried to do in this story, I think it did it better than anything else that I've ever read. And again, provided me with such amazing characters, ones with positive qualities and traits such as Mikkel and Giselle, although they aren't perfect as people, and ones that are very flawed and messed up in nature, such as Yukimasa and Jacopo, as well as an incredibly sympathetic character in Morgana, who I think as an antagonist should definitely be brought up amongst some of the best. And what's crazy to think is that apparently they get even more into her character in the DLC, if, which if I'm not mistaken is called A Requiem for Innocence, and I haven't even read that yet, and I still think she's insanely good up to this point. Although I'm definitely looking forward to reading it, I just wanted to give myself some time in doing so, and that'll probably end up being a separate video, as I've heard that actually delves into the relationship of Jacopo and Morgana more. This story was able to bring about very intense emotions in me that very few stories before this one have been capable of doing. And tackling many different themes, but primarily dealing with the past and sort of going about that was one that, as I said, really resonates with me probably more than any other theme that a story could get into. I found myself pleasantly surprised with how the ending turned out as I expected it to be far more bittersweet and instead we got uh, a pretty happy ending with how things ended up with Mikkel and Giselle 
which only cemented the story for me even further. Again, the only complaint I could see with this series is that it likes to take its time and the pacing, but is that really an issue when the payoff is so worth it and it's clearly building towards something every time? I think Doors 5, 6, and 7 are all 10 out of 10s, and I would say Door 8 is really an 11 out of 10, as it was even able to go back and really add more to Doors 1, 2, and 3 and their characters, while also giving an amazing conclusion to this series. And I think the way the series ended up structuring things really fits with the theme of the story, seeing how the past reflects itself in the present. Uh, an illusion within an illusion. The house in Fata Morgana. Which, in my eyes, is the best story that I've ever read.